VoIP Data Extraction, VX. John Whitson, CS6968, Summer 2014. This is the code walkthrough. Okay, the first step we're going to do is we're going to look at this uh, initialization database file. It just contains the schema. That is uh, the most important thing about it. We'll touch on a couple of things as we go by. Uh, you will see reference to the VX log. That is a logging module that I developed uh, to handle the logging of data. Very simple, but it also abstracts away the fact that there are differences in the print statement between Python 2.7 and Python 3. So there's a difference there. Uh, this contains a couple methods, uh, a couple functions inside of it. The init database is the uh, really important one. It simply creates the schemas that all these programs are going to use. Okay, um, that we have a concept of remote endpoints and local endpoints. That's back again tied to the IP addresses of the phone call. The local endpoint is actually the local user on his device and the remote endpoint is the remote user on his device. For the most part though with the remote endpoint all we see is the, C the server information. So the remote address and port and info really refer to the server rather than the actual um, remote endpoint all the way back at his client. The third key table is the media session table. This is where we actually capture the inputs to a call an individual call between a pair of endpoints. And again, we keep uh, indexes uh, here in order to point back to the uh, local endpoint and the remote endpoint. And then for their actual data exchange, we keep track of their IP addresses and ports, the protocol information, the start time and end times, and the source identifier, the SSRC, uh, which is used to actually tie the RTP, the audio data session, back to a call and back to the endpoints. And then the final table uh, in, that is created by this is the media features table, which has the SSRC of the session that it is processing about, okay, it is describing about for each entry, a tag, which is the name of the feature, and a value, which is the value of the feature. Okay, those are processed by the feature functions. They actually push back dictionaries with the tag value pairs and those dictionaries are inserted into this table along with the source identifier that identifies which session it comes from. Uh, I'm paranoid so I do this commit statement here and if there's an error I just ignore it but other than that we just leave it. Um, and then this is the main function that basically for the initializing the database all it takes is the name of the database file and that's the end of that. The next piece of code to run through is the scan SIP. Okay, this is the first stage after the initial of the database that analyzes the PCAP file and goes out and looks for the individual um, sessions for the SIP and the SDP and the RTP protocol decoding. Uh, in order to do that, we need dpacket. We need SQLite, we need the logging system as well. Dpacket actually is a very difficult learning curve to get started, but once you get working with it, it is very powerful and it has uh, integrated SIP support for that protocol, which is actually very useful. Uh, there are some global variables to help us identify what our local uh, network addresses are and our SIP base port. Uh, these are set defaults, they are actually command line parameters. Um, we're going to skip through the code fairly quickly. Um, we have a class, the local endpoint, that lines up with the local endpoint table in the database. Um, and there's really nothing exciting in this class other than um, we've got some operations for um, putting values in there. So it really doesn't have very many methods. It's got some interesting print ones. That was kind of fun. Um, we also have a remote um, endpoint class, which very much like the database has got a couple values in it and an ID and that's it. Uh, not particularly exciting. The really interesting one is the media session class, which again has a lot of information in it as we've seen before. Okay, 
but it the actual excitement is in the, the, the populating of the structure, not the actual definition of it. Um, we have a database class which handles all the database transactions. That's basically just an interface to SQLite 3, and it gives us the ability to write the local endpoints uh, and the remote endpoints and the tables uh, all from within a class. And that's really not very difficult technologically. Um, this one is an interesting function, is SIP. This actually looks at a piece of the UDP payload and determines whether or not it is actually a uh, SIP protocol packet or not. And the only way to know is actually to look at the base port that we've said and said, okay, if we're going to see SIP, it's going to be on this port. So we identify it that way. Uh, Wireshark is very, very clever in the way it does things. If you see, um, particularly with RTP, if you have not established a session yet, it just calls RTP plain old UDP. But once it can recognize that a session took place, then it calls it RTP. So it, it, Wireshark does a lot under the hood in terms of that. And uh, oh, we didn't need all that. We just need to be able to recognize which UDP packets were which. Um, so in this case, uh, is SIP is important. It helps us identify which packets have endpoint information in them. So this routine actually returns the endpoint information. Um, we have to look at this from two ways. Um, communications with the endpoints can happen both from the client to the server or from the server to the client. And in fact, um, the initiation of a call, namely the invite command and the headers can actually both be requests or responses. So you've got four cases. So we've essentially got, if the source port is the SIP based port, we've got a, was it a request or a response? And from that, we extract the to and from information. And then likewise, if the destination port was the SIP based port, then do it all again, but do it the other way. Okay. The end result is, is that we've populated a local endpoint and a remote endpoint. And so we go create those structures from the fields and return them from this function. So coming out of here, we've actually got what the endpoints are, what their information is. The parse SIP packet actually handles some of the protocol information. This is a, was a fairly complicated routine to write. Okay. Um, the important part here is we look for an invite command. Invite uh, commands on the SIP protocol means it's got a session description protocol or SDP attached to it. So in this case, we are looking for the audio identifier, which is identified by this string. Uh, we're looking here also now for the RTP information, which is identified by that string, which gives us the format. And the final one, we look for the reverse internet IP address for which we wish to communicate the real time data. Uh, for the local client, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, we're going to run the client and it's going to handle both the data and the signaling, the SIP and the STP. However, for the server, the server uses one IP address for uh, providing signaling protocols and services but it gives you a separate IP address for the real-time protocol. So we actually had to trap that out and identify which calls were which and who was tasking what. So this is fairly complicated. Um, so invite is the way to start a call. Obviously from you can tell by is the way to end a call. Act is the way to acknowledge. Uh, we kind of ignore those. In the process of setting up a call, okay, SIP slash 2.0 returns a set of um, error codes which involve ringing, uh, busy, okay, or if you get a buy that says, you know, with no answer, then obviously the call never took place. Okay, um, when we see a buy, obviously we want to stop the, the buy call, and so we shut that off. But if we see an invite back on the other side, then we also have to extract the audio and the IP address and the same thing. So since either side either the local client or the remote client can start a call and either one can acknowledge a call, we need to be able to make sure that we get both halves of that, that dialogue and they go both ways. And in this case, when we get an OK back on an invite, we flag that as an OK as well. So that means the call is actually set up. Yes, this is complicated. The standards are hundreds of pages long on this. Um, we needed a short function to determine if an IP packet came from a local source or not. 
So in this case, local, here are the two locals, the address mask and the address. So we basically take our address that we received, we turn it into a 32-bit integer, which is what interning is. We do an AND and we see if it's the same as our local masked address. And if it is, then yes, it's local, otherwise, no, it's not. That becomes important because in the next function, when we're going out and we're stripping, well, actually, a, a little bit down, I should say, let me qualify that. The, the first thing we've actually injected here with get UDP packets, we're only interested in UDP. So when we actually read the PCAP data from the file in this statement here, we actually put it all on a list and we actually go through the entire list. And if the packet is Ethernet and if its protocol is 17, which is UDP, then we sort. Otherwise, we throw it away. So we only have to look at the UDP data, and that's really helpful because that cuts down our data like by 90%. Okay, um, we do keep track of uh, what ports are available, so there's some utility routines there. Uh, collect endpoints is the next biggie. Okay, and again, once we've got all those UDP packets, we're going to eat analyze each packet going through it. Okay, we're going to pull out the UDP data. Here we see if it's SIP. So if we're going through this UDP data, we find a SIP packet. We're going to get the endpoint. We're going to parse the packet like we previously discussed. Okay, we're going to see if the local endpoint is someone we've seen before. If it is, then you know just do nothing. Otherwise, we're going to put it into our um, endpoint list and we'll write it to the database. Okay, same with the remote. If we get a new remote endpoint we, we've seen before, we won't do anything. Otherwise, we'll write it into the database. If we find an invite from the parsing of the packet, then we will create a new media session, which means a call is starting. And believe it or not, we have to hold that in a temporary list called the invite list until we actually get the OK. When we get the OK message back for our invitation, then we can find it in the list, finish populating its values, take it out of the pending invite list, and put it into our official media list, meaning a call exists for that. Okay. If it's busy, that means the call is not going to happen, so we just take it, then we get rid of it. Okay. We do actually append it, so the fact that it's there, it just doesn't have any, it, we're not waiting for an acknowledgement from it because we know the call happened but had no audio behind it. And then we return those three key lists, the local endpoint list, the remote endpoint list, and the list of calls between them. Okay, the next phase actually in this begins, okay, once we've got all that, let's go get the audio data. So there's a function here to test if a UDP packet is actually an RTP packet, meaning it's got RTP data in it. Uh, it turns out that for RTP, for audio, it's got a fixed packet length. It's always the same. Uh, it is 172 bytes, so that we will get 172 bytes back uh, of the payload of UDP. 12 of that is header for the RTP protocol, and 160 bytes of that are pure audio sample data that have been compounded per the codec. So to get that, we basically get the RTP information from D packet. We ask it for the sequence number. Each packet comes with a sequence number. Okay. And then we actually, at this point, we don't use it, but it's there. And then for the, we return the source identifier. One of those little coding oversights. Uh, the next function we goes through gets the raw RTP session. Essentially, that is getting one audio data session. You have to have the list of packets. You have to know what IP address and port it's coming from and what IP and ad address and port it's going to. And based on that, you can collect all the packets. And so that's what this does. Okay, we also look at each one as we're looking port to port for the analysis and if we see the source identifier we will copy it out and save it. We also copy out and save the start time and the end time and so when we return this we actually return a dictionary of data which is indexed by the sequence number and it has also the source identifier and the start time and the end time. And then when we go into 
this part we basically this is just writing the audio file so that's a matter of just writing out the keys we sort them in order in case packets come in out of order and just write it out to a file no biggie the power function the next level up is this get audio session to file that's where we're given our media uh, session our, our media session class structure that contains both sides now of a phone call between two endpoints and essentially we run like here the get raw RTP session on each side of that call and we track the results coming back including the start times and the source identifiers and then we write each one out to a file and those files are what go then as the input to the next phase at this point we're just at the parse arguments phase uh, not a big deal and then into the main function okay in which uh, we get the arguments uh, that we're expecting we set the base port we handle our local network setting we initialize our database connection so that we can read what's in the database we get our UDP packets we analyze uh, the packets for pairs of connected UDP ports we go collect our endpoints and get that local endpoint list, the remote list, and the media list. For each phone call in the media list, we then get the audio sessions out to file like we just discussed. And then we actually write it out to the database and we're done. That is a very intense piece of software to negotiate through all the protocols and the parsing that had to take place. The next function of uh, the file that we're going to look at, and the last one, as part of the code walk, is the comp audio set of files. It's actually this and the feature funks we'll look at next. Okay, uh, comp audio, again, it needs the numpy.fft module so that we can do our Fourier transform. Note that FFT is the fast Fourier transform. What we are actually calculating is a discrete Fourier transform. Uh, the fast part is that it takes advantage of the binary relationship of sinusoids and their frequencies in order to be computationally efficient. We also need the image library since we're generating PNG files. And here you can see where we import the feature funks uh, module uh, or file so that we can get all the feature functions that we want uh, automatically without having to modify this base piece of code. Okay, um, the only real interesting data structure in here is a thing called the session. <clears throat> the session contains the feature function list, and for each feature function we register, it's going to end up in that list as a class method, not an instance method. Okay, the, the feature funks is actually a, a class variable, not an instance variable. The same with the number of points in our FFT, which is 512. The number of steps that we advance in the number of samples each time we retake the FFT, which is 128. It's all powers of two make the computation go more smoothly. And the sampling rate, which is defined by our audio data, which is 8,000 samples per second. The initializer is kind of interesting because the initializer actually is handed a set of, of data. It's handed the path. And it automatically uh, takes that data, converts it to 16-bit data using the ULAW to linear uh, data conversion so that that way uh, it's uncompanded so we've got raw samples available from the get-go okay this is the compute spectrum routine which basically does a sliding window through the sample data and takes FFTs as it goes and stores the results now the key thing here is is that the spectrum data structure is actually a list of list of frequencies so it's a two-dimensional array the inside array is actually the individual frequencies from DC to 4000 Hertz or essentially 0 to 256 uh, row, uh, columns or values and each one of those is a different frequency and then every time we slide and retake the disk the fast Fourier transform we add another row so the outer index in the day in the spectrum is actually the uh, number of this of the spectrum in time 
going forward. Okay, so there's some overlap there and that's intent because we want to be able to catch the rise and fall of some of the data sample um, noises that we pick up. Uh, one thing to note if, if you're a signal analysis person, okay, we do get complex values back from the fast Fourier transform. We're feeding it only real data so we can use the RFFT, but we are getting back complex data, so what we're really interested in is the amplitudes. And NumPy gives us a function to convert that automatically to amplitudes, and so that is what we actually do. So that's what the numpy.abs function does. Okay, and then at the same time, we, we calculate what the absolute maximum amplitude is. We use that for the image scaling. Okay, going down, uh, two other methods that are in this session structure are the add feature function guess what that does you feed it a function it adds it to the classes class meth uh, class variable that holds that feature list okay and execute feature functions which basically goes through each function in that list and executes it by giving it itself which is as the object and the spectrum as a parameter <clears throat> what comes back from those functions is actually a dictionary of features in which a feature is the tag value pair like we saw in the database and we just update the dictionary with those new values every time from each of the feature functions so that way we aggregate them together and they're all in the right place um, this is a function that people will probably want to mess around with if they're really particular the write spectrum file, this is where we generate the PNG image file based upon the frequency and the amplitudes that are in uh, the spectrum. And the place that people want to play around with it is in the colors, how you plot the intensity. A grayscale 0 to 255 is kind of limiting in terms of what you can see. We've extended it, and there's no a lot of, not a lot of comments in here, but you have to know RGB in order to figure it out. So I had to mess with this for a little while. But the point being that the reds have 128 intensity values at the highest level. The yellows then have another 128 uh, intensity levels below that. And the bottom 256 intensity levels are all grayscale. So this way we can actually copy, capture about 512 levels of grayscale or of, of uh, color intensity in the spectrum plot without um, you know, get it getting too bizarre the way the colors look. So that's kind of helpful. It actually kind of shows uh, some of the highlights. And we use the image library to do this. We do a whole bunch of put pixels and then we just write out the file as a PNG file. Um, a little piece of history here. The ULaw to linear conversion actually is a very old piece of Sun Microsystems code. Um, this I actually got it hosted from uh, Apple, but if you actually visit that link, you'll see that the authorship is Sun Microsystems. Uh, this has to be 20 years old in the code. It was in C. Um, I converted it personally into uh, Python, but just as a note that uh, it was derived from another source. Okay, there's some conversion routines. Um, this is the execute routine essentially for the uh, audio uh, comparison functions we get a list of each of the audio files and so the goal is to open the file read the data okay then we're going to recover the source identifier which is the first part of the actual file name with all the directories removed okay so we recover that number and whatever number is in there is going to be whatever it is okay um, at this point in the program, we don't care what it is, except it will try to link it back in the database. So if you start using, um, you know, other hexadecimal numbers, that's fine. If you, if you use a real string, you'll probably get an error in the conversion trying to interact it in the database because it's expecting a hexadecimal number. Okay, but in this case, um, we try to, to create a session out of it, given the data and the source. So that'll give us our session. We then compute the spectrum, so we build our, our uh, spectrogram data structure for that. We then write it to a file and then we execute the feature functions and otherwise we print an error. Um, once we have all those feature functions we then are going to go out and this is how we update the database. You can see it's a simple insert into the media features table. Uh, nothing really exciting there. Okay, 
Um, this function essentially looks at the internet information that was stored in the media session file and it does it and breaks it out and adds the RTP addresses, the protocols, the formats, the timing. Okay, uh, depending upon, again, since we don't know which whether we're talking remote to local or local to remote, we actually have to look at that and it could be either way. So that's why we have to do the second part twice. Okay, it just it's an if statement. Um, after that, there's just some code to emit HTML. Okay. Um, that's not particularly exciting. And then the main function basically does some announcements, uh, opens the log file, uh, checks and gets the uh, base parameters. It here's that function I mentioned before, the VX feature functs.configure function, which actually calls into the VX feature functs module, and anything that's registered with that function will become available to the base class. Then we open the database. Uh, down here we execute each one of the other files on our path. It could be just one. It's got to be at least one. And then we produce our HTML, we update the database again, and then we close it and exit. And so finally, the last piece of the code we want to walk through is the uh, feature funks file. Okay, and for this one start at the bottom and we'll go through one of the feature functions this is that configure routine right here where base is our session class and log l is a log file okay whoop de do um, but essentially anybody who wants to extend the feature functions that are used by a comp audio is going to put a line in here adding the function name into that okay and then as we go up we're going to actually look at one of the functions the first one, FFSNR, is given S, which we know is a session class, and the data, which is the spectrum. And in this case, we're going to block off the lo a low frequency range and a high frequency range. This is typically what we call the, the voice range, and in uh, generic sense, it is what we call signal, as opposed to noise, because what we're going to do with SNR is compute a signal to noise ratio. Okay, how much of intelligent information is there versus how much is considered noise? So, what we do is essentially um, create a features dictionary that is empty. If we have any kind of an error, in this case, for some reason we're given an empty spectrum, just return an empty dictionary. Okay, do not throw exceptions except you, unless you're debugging because the code won't like that and you start to have things like crumble all around you. So don't throw exceptions out of the feature functions. So in this case, we need to convert our frequencies into the, the bin indexes. Um, so we're going to convert that. And what we do is we get a number out for a low bin and a high bin. So if you can imagine in the spectrum gram, we're actually going to cut the center or something like the center portion out of the data. And so what we're going to do is, and that's exactly what happens here, we're going to add up all the frequency amplitudes from the low bin to the high bin, and that becomes our signal over all the data. And then we're going to add the zero frequency up to the low bin. That's going to become half of our noise. And the next line adds the high frequency bin all the way up to the top of the frequency, and that becomes the rest of our noise. And so very simply, then we're going to say, what's the average amount of energy in the signal. So we take that sum and we divide it by the number of rows we got, which is the number of FFTs, or otherwise known as the Y width. And then we say, okay, do the same for noise. So that's sum two divided by the number of rows. That gives us our average noise. And then we can say, okay, what is the signal to noise ratio? So that's the division of the signal divided by the noise. Obviously a high number there, and this is important, a high number means that you've got a lot of signal and a little noise, so that's a nice clear answer. However, a low number means that you have not so much signal and a lot more noise, so that it's harder to pull the signal out. In fact, the number will always be greater than one. If you actually get a signal to noise ratio in, in just as a ratio, less than one, that means there's more noise than signal and you have no hope of figuring out what's going on. Okay.
We also do this traditionally in the industry in decibels. So to convert amplitudes ratios into decibels, we multiply that by 10. That's the decit part. And then we take the base 10 logarithm of the ratio, and that gives us um, the unit of bells. So 10 times a bell shows you decibels. Um, and so that number tells us then just how big that is, and that is used in the industry. So each of these things have been indexed by a tag with these values. They're into our feature dictionary, and then we just return that. And that makes it into the rest of the system. And that essentially completes the code walkthrough.